If you have your Bibles, please go back to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And uh, this is my final sermon on the series of the family. Psalm 51, please. This is my final sermon. And uh, when I prepared my initial series on the family, um, I did not include this sermon. This wasn't really part of my initial uh, preparation. Uh, And then I felt it was very important for me to cover this topic because um, there are many people in my church, I mean, even within this church and people with the church up there in Queensland that come from broken homes, that come from homes where they've you know, didn't grow up with mum and dad together or, you know, they grew up with stepfathers or, you know, maybe they've been divorced and remarried and, you know, they haven't got that uh, exact biblical framework of, of marriage and family that we see in the Bible. And so it was super important that we look at um, the families, you know, the broken homes, the families which don't have it exactly together. You know, it's, it's not necessarily a child's, it's, obviously it's not a child's fault if he grows up in a family where his parents are divorced. It's not, not, it's not his fault, right? Uh, and, and so sometimes people that grow up in these kinds of family situations, they might feel a little undervalued. They might feel they're not important or, you know, they destroy their lives or they feel like God can't use them or, or things like that. And we need to, you know, provide an answer, a biblical answer to these people and for them to understand how important they are to God and how God can still use people that have come from broken families, broken marriages, that have made mistakes in the past. And what does God have to say about this? One of the experiences that I've, that I've had in my life as a pastor is I've often been approached by people who are in broken homes, divorced, remarried, or whatever, you know, these situations. And, you know, the question is always, well, what about me? What about my situation? What does God want for me, you know? And the thing about that, there is no magic answer. Like, there's not this perfect answer, okay? Sometimes the mistakes we've made in the past, you can't change that. The mistakes are made, and you've just got to learn how to put that behind you and move on with life, you know? There's not this magic bullet that answers every question for every broken home situation. And every broken home is different to another broken home. You know, there's not this answer. What God does for us in the Bible, He gives us the ideal scenario, right? And the ideal scenario, I'll just give you quickly the title for the sermon tonight, is The Broken Home. The title is The Broken Home. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not covering abusive uh, fa- parents or anything. I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about abuse right now. Like, I'm not talking about, you know, dads that, you know, become alcoholics and they become violent and aggressive to their families. I'm not covering that topic or any kind of sexual abuse, anything like that. When I talk about broken homes, what is a home? What is a family? The marriage, you know, and the children that would develop out of that marriage. So anything that breaks that situation, you know, I I would term a broken home. Okay. And, you know, the Bible gives us a a very important, you know, it, it defines for us what a home should be like. You know, what marriage should be like. You know, it should be one man, one woman virgins going into marriage for the very first time not having given themselves to anybody else prior to that right i'm talking about the biblical model here i'm talking about what god expects what god says it ought to be you know go into this marriage that one marriage the vows are exchanged right the husband says i'm going to love you you know as christ loved the church i'm going to give of you of myself sacrificially you know till death do us part and and for the wife to turn around and say yes you know, I, I, I take you as my husband, I take you as my head, you know, I, you know I, I vow to be submissive to your authority. You know, they make these vows before God and before witnesses, and they keep that vow for the rest of their lives. That's the biblical framework. And from that marriage, that's where children come, right? When God wants us to raise a godly seed, that's the, that's the framework, that's the model that God has given us in the Bible. And anything that takes away from that, anything that breaks that framework, you could see or or think of as a broken home. I'm also going to use the term a blended family. And I'll I'll explain all these things as we go through this in the Bible. But I hope you're still in Psalm 51. If you're not there, just go back there to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And as Nicholas was reading that, I hope you noticed the, the, the sorrow of King David. As King David was saying these words, you can probably see he's downcast, he's upset, he's full of sorrow. And the context of Psalm 51, now, I don't know if you all have this in your Bible. Before verse 1, it tells us this. I don't know, maybe you all have this. It says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him, 
after he had gone into Bathsheba. Now, I don't know if you remember the story in the Old Testament where David already had multiple wives, which was wrong, right? And then he saw Bathsheba, you know, he lusted after her. He was, she was already the wife of another man. In fact, she was the wife of one of his most loyal and powerful warriors that he had. And while her husband was at war, he took her, King David took her for himself, right? Then she falls pregnant and they try to cover it up. It ends up with David basically killing her husband. You know, sending her husband to war, the troops pulling back and the enemy killing her husband because they were trying to hide this secret. Well, they hid the secret. If you guys know this story, it's David's great shame in the Bible. You know, um, but they, they hide this secret for several months. In fact, they hide this secret all the way till Bathsheba gives birth. Then Nathan the prophet turns up and says, you know what? You've done wrong. You've done wrong. And then King David, when he realizes his grief, his sorrow, the big mistake, he realizes he can't hold this as a secret. He writes this psalm here in Psalm 51. And I want you to notice number, verse number 17 there. Psalm 51 verse 17. It says here, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. What is, what is David saying? He's broken about it, right? He's broken hearted by what he did, by the sin that he committed. Not only is he broken hearted, he caused a broken home. He caused a, 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 a marriage to be broken apart. You know, he caused his own family. He was already with several wives. He had already destroyed the framework that God wanted, the model that God wanted in his life. And there he goes and commits adultery, adultery with another man's wife. He brought brokenness. He brought further brokenness in his life, in Bathsheba's life. You know, Uriah lost his life uh, about this situation. And so we have broken homes out of this situation. And because of this, David says, look, I've got a broken heart. I've got a broken spirit, right? A broken and contrite, oh, oh God, that would not despise. So this gives you the context of Psalm 51. David's brokenhearted, right? He's really in grief. He's repenting, repenting, you know, to the Lord. He's asking the Lord for forgiveness. And, uh, and so this leads us into the, st the topic of the broken home. Now, even though God has given us a great framework of marriage and family, even though he's given us these instructions and for the past, I don't know how many months I've been covering this, this uh, series on the family, you know, I've taught you what the Bible teaches, what, what, what God's expectation is for man and woman, for the children, you know, um, husbands to love their wives, wives to be submissive, children to obey the parents, etc., discipline, you know, all, all those kinds of things that God tells us. But here's the thing, even if you have that perfect marriage, even if you have that perfect framework and model, even if your, if your marriage right now lines up perfectly with the Bible, you're still going to have challenges in your marriage. You're still going to have problems in your marriage. And the reason for that is not because God's method is, is wrong. The reason for that is because we have the sinful flesh. We still have that old man. We still have that flesh that is selfish, right? We still have that flesh that seeks to go about doing things our own ways rather than doing things God's way, right? And so because of our selfishness, we can cause problems in our marriage. We can cause challenges and complications. And so even if you have the perfect marriage, according to God's word, you're still going to go through difficulties, right? You're still going to go through challenges. Now that's important to bring up because... When you've got a broken home, when you've got a blended family, when you have a, a marriage which does not line up exactly with the model that God has given us, you're going to have not just those regular challenges, not just the regular problems of the married couple after the biblical model, but you're going to have other complications. You're going to have other difficulties, other problems, right, in your marriage than what God really wanted for you in your life. But this is something that you just have to understand if you've come from this situation or you're in this situation and say, well, this is where, where I'm at, God. This is how it is right now. You know, I made mistakes in the past. What can I do except to, you know, uh, say sorry to you, except to confess that to you, Lord. Now, and please help me to move forward. And so that's the, the theme. That's the topic that I want to cover today, the broken home. And so I've already covered what the ideal biblical family was. And, I, and again, I've covered this throughout the series and uh, one thing that I want to first begin, before I go into the broken home, I want to talk about the blended family. The blended family. Now, the idea behind a blended family, you know, uh, uh, contrary to the, the biblical model that we have in the Bible, 
A blended family is when two families basically somehow come together. Okay? And, and there's basically a, a biblical way for you to have a blended family. There's nothing wrong with, with a certain way that the Bible tells us about a blended family. Then there is another way, which is common to, to many Australians, where they have a blended family, but it's a blended family because of sin, okay? because of mistakes in the past. And so the biblical model or the biblical based blended family is when someone becomes a widow, right? They're married, they're married, they have children, and then let's say the husband passes away. The husband passes away, the wife now finds herself as a widow. Well, you know what the Bible instructs? If a widow is under the age of 60, the Bible, God encourages that woman to get remarried. To get remarried. And though she, you know, she might find a man who's not been married in the past, or she might find a man who's himself a widow. You know, And biblically, they will be allowed to get married. And so now you have a blended family situation where you have this married couple, but then there are children that are not from that relationship. There are children in that marriage that are not from that relationship, but from previous relationships, right? From, from, from the spouse that has passed away in the past. That would be a blended family, but that is one that is biblical. That one is right. There's nothing sinful or wrong about that. That's exactly how God you know, uh, desire, desires a widow to go about, you know, trying to find a husband or the other way around. If a man is a widow, to find a wife. And so that's a, a biblical blended model. But then we have the blended family because of sin, right? The blended family because of sin. And uh, this, this is uh, basically where, you know, you, you enter a marriage relationship, you enter into a marriage, but one of the, or maybe both, or one of the, one of the spouses has, has children from a previous relationship, but not from a previous marriage. You know, it, it maybe maybe fornication. You know, or maybe maybe divorce, maybe divorce or fornication, these kinds of things. And you have a blended family where they come together. But the reason why there's children outside of that situation is because of sin. Actually, divorce, I'm, I'm going to cover that later on. Okay, but this is a situation where it's fornication. Because of sin, one of the spouse or both of the spouse have children, then they get married. And so once again, you have children in this family, children in this relationship that are not a product of that marriage, but a product of outside of that. And so that's another blended family that we're going to, you know, many, there are many, many Australians like this, many, many Australian families that are like this. And uh, it's, it's a situation, it's a sin, it's a problem. But again, when these people get saved, when they realize they, they, you know, they get saved, they realize what God says about the Bible, then they, they put themselves, they go, man, the mistakes that I've made, you know, they can beat themselves up. And I don't want that to be the case. I'm not preaching this to make anybody feel bad. You know, I'm not preaching this if you've, you know, come from a divorce, remarried, uh, b- broken home, you've had children out of wedlock or whatever, you know, fornication. You know, it's not good. We shouldn't go around celebrating that, right? But, there's, you know, God can still use you, right? You're not a waste of a person, okay? And many times people do this because we live in a society where they don't know any difference. You know, the, the, the once upon a time, and this is before my time, it was normal for a, a man and woman that loved each other, liked each other, to get married. Now they're encouraged, right? Oh, don't get married just yet. Just live together. You know, go buy a house together. Try before you buy. Work it out. If it doesn't work out, you know, don't, don't get married. If it works out, then maybe you can get married. And so by, by encouraging this kind of behavior, now we have a society, we have a generation of blended families, of broken homes, these kinds of things, because... You know, our, our nation has moved away from the model, from the framework that God has given us in His Word. And so, my point is, the point I'm trying to bring out of this, I want every marriage in this church to be a happy marriage. I want every marriage to be one that lasts till death do us part. You know, I want you to, when you get old, when you're lying on your deathbed, to look back in life and say, I had a fantastic marriage. Praise God for my, for my wife. Praise God for my husband. Praise God for my children. That's what I want for you on this earth, right? Then we have all eternity in heaven. But right now on this temporal plane, I want you to be able to just enjoy the marriages you have. But I have to be real with you and tell you there are going to be problems. There are going to be difficulties. And again, I've already covered the the ideal scenario through many, many series. But when you have a blended family situation, you create further complications, further challenges, right? Say, why is this? Well, think about it. If you're... You know, whether it's a biblical blended marriage or if it's a blended family because of sin, there is going to be a a, a, uh, a husband or a wife that has children in that marriage 
that is not their own, right? They're not the biological parents of those children. And so that's going to bring further challenges, right? And uh, let me just explain, some, uh, let me explain the, the biblical model here and then the, 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 the model because of sin. The advantage of the biblical model is this. Let's say, let's say my wife passes away and I get remarried, you know? Well, my children, they're going to have to mourn for mum. They're going to have to, you know, keep her in the heart, keep them in, in, the, in, in their memory. But then I might get married, right? I might get remarried. But here's the thing. There's a very clear transition for my children, right? A very clear transition. That was our biological mother. That was mum. You know, she was our authority. But this new woman that dad's going to get married to, that's now going to be our stepmother. That's going to be the woman who has authority in this family. And there's a clear division. There's a clear separation there, right? Because the first mother is gone. So that's the biblical model. So that creates challenges that creates further complications right because now that woman who normally when you get married it's it's a brand new start but now that woman who if she gets married to me will have like 10 kids right to to think about right i mean it's a big job right 10 kids at once right that there's, there's and, and then you know having to to learn to love them learning to uh get the uh their, their uh, uh respect and and their obedience it's going to be much more difficult with children that have already grown up you know listening to other parents to then have to transition that to another person. Nothing wrong with it, I'm just saying there's challenges, there's difficulties, okay? Well, when you come to a blended family because of sin, you have the same challenge, but then you have a further complication, okay? Because those children were born out of fornication, and somewhere, somewhere out there, the biological parent is out there as well. You don't have that smooth transition from mum who passed away to new mum, now you have new mum and you still have biological mum somewhere out there or biological dad somewhere out there who probably still wants to be involved in their lives somewhere, somehow. Okay, probably. And here's the thing about, this was difficult with believers, you know, Christian families is that when, when you know, once they have come from blended families and things like this, is that sometimes that spouse or that, that ex, you know, or, you know, that, 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 uh, that biological father, biological mother are probably not believers, and they want to spend time with the children. You're trying to instruct them with the, with the Bible. You're trying to teach them the way of God. You're trying to tell them to do the right thing, to stay away from the drugs and stay away from alcohol, you know, to stay away from worldliness. And there comes the other father or the other mother, right? And says, come on, just, you know, live it up. You know, let's go watch that horror movie. Let's just, you know, why, why you know, and, and so they're trying to influence your children in, in a way which you would not want them to be influenced. And, and so it presents another difficulty, another challenge. Now, when I say that there are these challenges, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not saying your marriage is going to fail. I'm not saying that your children are going to uh, turn out like the devil or something. I'm not saying that. I'm just trying to be real, right? I'm just saying, look, there's further challenges, further difficulties that the marriage that follow the biblical model won't have. Again, they will have their troubles, normal family troubles. You're going to have those same ones. Plus all these other things that are, are, are added in, right? All the other complications and, and relationships that are still out there because of the uh, blended family. All right, so that's the blended family, biblical and because of sin. The next point that I want to get to is the broken family or the broken home. And this has to do, and I know, I'm not, I know I've not gone through much scripture. I will go through scripture later on. But uh, this has to do with broken marriages. You've made a vow in the past till death do us part, and that's been broken, okay? And this can cause a blended family, but it's broken in the sense that those marriage vows were broken. Because if, if you, you know, live in fornication, you haven't made those vows, okay? Now, uh, just, just very quickly, one thing I did want to cover with a, with, a, with a blended family, one thing that I want to cover very quickly, is that, you know, I, I have somebody who's very, that I'm very close to, you know, my family, who is living with his girlfriend, and they have their own children, together you know and uh and uh sometimes i hear because they're not saved right i, I hear them say things like ah oh, you know she just doesn't listen to me you know she's just not submissive to me and then i hear her say well you know he's like this and he's like that and you know he's not stable and and blah blah and i hear them you know arguing or pointing each other's faults out and say why isn't he more like this and why isn't she more like that but they're not married you know, and you know, it, it's one of these difficult things because she never 
made a vow to say that she would be submissive to you. And you never made a vow to say that you'll love her sacrificially. You never made a vow that to say that you're going to be in charge, you're going to lead this family. So why is there any expectation whatsoever? One thing you need to understand about the biblical families is they start with the marriage. The marriage. The marriage makes it husband and wife. The marriage makes it a new family unit. That's what makes a family. And if, you know, again, you know, in this day and age, we look at that relationship, we call that a de facto relationship, right out there. Boyfriends and girlfriends living together, maybe having children together. We say they're de facto, they get the same legal status as someone that's married, you know. Um, but biblically, they're not married. Biblically, they're not husband and wife. They've not made those vows. Biblically, they are not a family. Even though they feel they're a family, even though our society says they're a family, but biblically, they're not a family because they haven't been married. Okay, they've not exchanged those vows. And so, you know, we, we need to understand what God says about this. And so when I see de facto relationships and I see them arguing, I'm like, what are you arguing about? You haven't made any commitment. At least if my, if my wife stops being submissive to me, I can turn around and say, honey, remember the promise you made on our wedding day? All right. Or if I stop loving her the way that Christ loved the church, she can say, remember the vow that you made me before God and before witnesses? How can you say that in a de facto relationship? There was no vow. There was no promise. You know, there is no promise that they're going to stick around, right? So we need to understand that. You know, that is not a biblical family. A biblical family is founded on the marriage. And if the marriage does not have any children, you know, some people struggle to have kids. We see this even in the Bible. It's still a family. It's still a family even if there are no children. It's the marriage. It's the husband and wife that creates the new family units, okay? That leads into the broken family, the broken home. And again, this is not about abusive homes. This is about broken homes where there's been divorce and remarriage, or maybe just divorce or whatever. You know, again, there are different situations. Every, everyone is in, in different situations. And if you go, if you're still in Psalm 51, look at verse number three. Psalm 51, verse three. And, uh, you know, the, the, the difficulty with the broken family, the broken vows is once again, yes, now these, new ch these children have to learn how to be respectful to this new parent, right? Once again, the biological parent is out there somewhere. You know, the, the vows have been broken. They're out there somewhere. Sometimes those other biological parents have been remarried. Sometimes they are going into a marriage with a person who has their own children or they're having other children. And so you've got these half brothers and half sisters. And so, you know, as, as the family unit gets broken and more broken, again, there's, there's these further threads that are out there, you know, these connections, and it's, again, it's going to cause more challenges, more difficulties, more complexities, right, in, in your life. And um, if you look at Psalm 51 verse 3, this is something you just need to understand. It's not going to go away. You know, these challenges, these complexities. Look what, look what David says. He goes, purge me with hyssop. And I shall be clean. Sorry, I'm reading the verse, wrong, wrong verse. Sorry, verse number three. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me, says David. Right? So David, once he got rebuked by the prophet Nathan, Nathaniel, David was like, look, I acknowledge my transgressions. Now, that's what we should do. I'm not talking about salvation here. I'm talking about once we're saved, once we're trying to walk in the Lord, once we commit sin... And you need to confess that before God to have a good relationship with the Father. You need to acknowledge your sin. And King David says here, yes, I acknowledge that I've done wrong. I acknowledge my transgressions. But then look what he says at the end. He says, and my sin is ever before me. You know what he's saying? He's, saying, he's not saying that God won't forgive him. He's not saying that this sin has not been paid for by Jesus Christ. He's saying it's just ever before him. You know, one, one sad thing about sin, especially when it comes to families, is that, yes, the sin's been, been paid for by Jesus Christ. Yes, God has forgiven you. Yes, you need to stop beating yourself up about it. Yes. But many times the consequences of your sins are ever before you. Sometimes you just can't fix it. It's just, it's just a constant reminder. It's, it's constantly out there, right? And I, I'm saddened when I, when I hear of, of, of parents and and, uh, you know, they have to give their children, I'm talking about Christian parents, they have to give the previous biological parent access to the children. 
and, and they're worried and, and, and they're just praying that they wouldn't be influenced negatively. They, they wouldn't be influenced to be worldly. And I, my heart breaks for them. But the thing is, their sin is ever before them. You know, this is like just a natural consequence of our sin. Even though it's been forgiven, the consequences are still out there many times. And it's a sad thing when it impacts families and it impacts children. But this is just a reality. You just have to accept it. I come from a broken home. I've had broken marriage vows. There might be other children out there, biological fathers and mothers out there. And I just have to acknowledge that my sin is ever before me. And you have to acknowledge it. You can't ignore it. You have to acknowledge it because once you acknowledge it, you'll be able to move on in life. Once you just say, this is just the reality of my life, you just say, well, Lord, I just need you to help me to move on, to move past this, Lord. Please help me in these challenges, these extra difficulties that I have in my life. Look at verse number seven. He says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. So, of course, he's asking the forgiveness of God for what he's done. And he says, look, I'm going to be white as snow. But at the same time, the sin's ever before him. Okay? The consequences, the, 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 you know, the, the situation is always going to be there. It's always going to be in his mind. And so, if you look at verse number 10, verse number 10, I want to go through this psalm of David. Okay? And David's got that broken heart. David's caused broken families, broken vows, broken relationships. He's committed adultery. And so we see here how David fixes himself up. We see how David lifts himself up, goes before God, and he's able to move forward in his life. And we saw immediately, you know, if, if you've made these kinds of mistakes in your past, the first thing you need to do, acknowledge your sin and ask God to forgive you. Okay? Ask God to forgive you. And maybe you've already done that. Praise God. One thing that I see many people in this situation do wrongly, though, they know God has forgiven them, but then they don't forgive themselves happens a lot they can't forgive themselves for what they've done and they beat themselves up and they get sorrow they have sorrow they get depressed and and they just can't do anything great for god because they're stuck in its prison you know and it's like but you know god has forgiven you jesus was on the cross he wore the crown of thorns he was whipped he was beaten he was crucified for you he took it all he took on your sin he took my sin he took on the sin of the whole world it's been paid for you got to move on Praise God that Jesus Christ has done that for us. You know, instead of you being punished for your divorces and remarriages and broken homes, Jesus was punished for you, you know, and you need to move on. But, you know, again, I see these believers sometimes in a cage, stuck. They don't know what to do and feel like they're a failure. It's time to move on. You've got to move on. Ask God to help you. Verse number 10, verse number 10, Psalm 51, verse 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So these believers that are constantly beating themselves up, constantly sorrow, what do they need? They need right here. They need their right spirit renewed. They need to say, God, please renew in me the right spirit within me. You know, God does not want you to go around just constantly regretting what you've done, constantly thinking about the past. We all have a past, okay? I've grown up in a Christian home. I've grown up in church. I have a past. We all have a past. We've all made mistakes in our lives. All of us. Some people more than greater than others. But we've all made mistakes, right? We've all made mistakes. And so when we get downcast, when we think about the mistakes we've done, you've got to ask God to renew that right spirit in you, right? The Holy Spirit to give you the joy, to give you the motivation, to give you the zeal to be focused on the kingdom of God rather than your mistakes. And then verse number 11 says, cast me not away from thy presence. And this is what happens when you commit sin. As you commit sin, because in, in, in God there is no darkness, right? God is light in him, there is no darkness at all, the Bible says. So when we commit sin, we break fellowship with God the Father. We break that fellowship. And sometimes, if you go a long time committing sin, long time not confessing your sin before God, you're going to feel like, where is God? Where is his presence? I just, I don't know where... Where have you gone, God? Right? And this is what David is saying. He's saying, cast me not away from thy presence. He wants to renew that relationship. You know, he confesses his sin. He wants to have that clean heart. And then it says, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So he wants to maintain a close fellowship, a close walk with God. And this is what you need to do to get past your broken families, your broken relationships, is to be able to ask God for that relationship with him. 
The greatest thing about having God as our Father, the greatest thing about having Jesus as our brother and our Savior, is that you may, you may never have the perfect biblical family, right? Maybe you grew, grew up in the divorce situation. Maybe now you just you can't get it back how God wants it, your own family, right? You've grown up in a messed up home. You've got your own messed up home. And you go, I'm, I'm totally messed up. The greatest thing about having God as your father is that you belong to a home, you belong to a family, a spiritual family that can never be broken. Praise God. You have a father who will always be there. You haven't got a father that might leave home or that gets drunk and beats up his, his kids or does anything stupid or, or you know, cheats on, on his wife. No, you have God the Father who loves you, God who's made you a son of God who has a home for you in heaven, has mansions on high and he's given you New Life Baptist Church here in Sydney so you can have brothers and sisters in the Lord. You're part of God's family. That's the greatest thing about being saved. We can mess up our temporary homes. We can. We can make big mistakes, but you can't mess up the home with God. You know, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sins. Brothers and sisters in the Lord is the best family to be part of. And just like any family, we're not always going to get along. We might rub each other around a little bit. I can't believe he did that. Why didn't he say hi to me? Why didn't you? Look, we're a family, okay? We're a family because of Jesus Christ. Praise God that a whole bunch of strangers can come together in one building. You know, the only thing we have in common is Jesus Christ and we can have fellowship, we can rejoice together we, and we're part of that family. We're going to be forever. Get used to each other because you're going to be together for all of or a thousand years and then for all the new heavens and the new earth, however, you know, eternity, you know. <laughs> Get used to it, right? It's going to be like this forever, all right? So um, verse number 12, please. Verse number 12. And this is so important. He says here in verse number 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. So he's not saying that he's lost his salvation. But David has lost something about his salvation. What was it? The joy of his salvation, right? The joy of the salvation of God. And uh, think about the time you knew, you definitely knew you got saved. Think about the time you knew you, you didn't have to go to hell anymore. That your sins have been paid for. You realize it's a free gift and once I have it, I can never lose it. Once you realize that, that truth and that freedom that you had, right? That joy that you had, you know, praise God for that. And sometimes people get very zealous, very excited. They just want to serve God with the rest of their life. And then, you know, just like any, any, any life, you go through problems, you go through persecution, you go through hardships and you get cast down. You become self-centered, you become self-focused and you can forget the joy of your salvation. What a, what a thing to joy in, right? Because here's the thing. Again, I can mess up my life. I can mess up my family. You know, I could maybe, my kids might grow up one day and say, Dad, I hate you. I want nothing to do with you. I mean, I hope that never happens, right? I hope that I hope it never mess up that bad, right? But I can truly mess up my life. But no matter how much I mess up my life, even if I, you know, you know did something stupid and, and, I, and, my, and I lost my life at an early age, right? Because of my stupidity, because of my sin, it's never going to be as bad as going to hell. Never be as bad as going to hell. And that's why the Bible says here that we can have a joy of salvation. That should give us the greatest joy of all things. When you're downcast, when you're upset, when you're beating yourself up for the mistakes in the past, just remember the joy of God's salvation that you have before you. This is what's going to give you true joy in life. Okay? It's not the money and the properties and and, and the pleasures of this life, what's going to give you true joy is when you can reflect back and look at the salvation that God has given you. And when you can rejoice in your salvation, you're going to find you're going to be able to rejoice in many, many things, even the smallest things, because you have the right priorities in life. Okay? Rejoice in your salvation. Look at verse number 13. Verse number 13. And this is great. This is one of the best things you can do when you're upset, when you're full of sorrow, when you're full of regret. He says in verse number 13, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. What did David say? Lord, forgive me. Let me move on. Let me be in your presence, Lord. Give me back the joy. And once he has the joy, he goes, I'm going soul winning. That's what he does, right? He's, he's going to convert the sinners unto God. He says that I'm going to teach transgressors thy ways. Say, what's the way? Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me, said Jesus Christ. You know what's going to help you in life? If you're someone, and I know all of us have different weaknesses, there are some people that are very self-centered, right? 
there's two ways to be self-centered. Uh, you got the selfish person who wants everything for themselves. They want to be the center of attention. They're very self-centered. And then you have the self-centered person that is constantly, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, constantly um, thinking negative thoughts about themselves. You know, what does this person think of me? If I, go, if, I, if, I, if I put on this piece of clothing, what will people say about me? They're constantly thinking about what others think about them. And normally, when, when that's, that's another way of being self-centered, right? And, and this can cause, again, sorrow, you know, and, and you're just focused on yourself. You're looking at all your mistakes. But the greatest thing, the thing that I realize that gets me out of the times when I'm self-centered is when I can be a help to other people. When I can look at other people and say, well, other people are going through struggles as well. Other people are going through problems. And one thing I didn't realize until I became a pastor, you know, when I was just a regular church person just sitting in the pew, I knew I had issues sometimes and I knew other people had issues. But when I became a pastor, people became more confident and, you know, with mistakes that they've that, done in the past or, or situations they're currently in. And I realized, man, my church is made up of messed up people, right? My church is made up of people that are really struggling, you know, and it breaks your heart when you think about that. But you know what's good about it is then it helped me to be self-focused about my problems because many times my problems are insignificant compared to what some other people are going through. You know, I've got somebody in my church up in Queensland that doesn't know if they'll be alive in a couple of years. You know, I can just think about how, how heavy that would be on their heart, how, how much that would weigh on their shoulders. You know, and when you start thinking about other people, it's going to help you to overcome your own problems. And when you can help other people, praise God, you're going to feel a lot better about yourself. When you can lift other people up, encourage other people, you're going to feel a lot more happier. And when you go out soul winning and you convert people to Jesus Christ, you're going to feel fantastic. That's another soul that is going to heaven. Praise God. They don't have to burn in hell for all eternity. I'll see that person one day. Hey, they might not come to church. I may never see them again, but I'm going to see them in heaven. Praise God. And they're going to come up to me in heaven and say, thank you. Remember that time you came to my house and knocked my door and gave me the gospel? Man, it's going to be awesome. Right? But that's how you overcome the sorrow that we all have. The difficulty is by focusing on other people, by being a blessing, a help to other people. Look at verse number 15, if we can drop down to verse number 15. O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth, show forth thy praise. So this is another way. So you help to people, go soul winning, but also lift up your hearts, your praise, your singing unto God. And church is a great time. You know, I know some, you struggle to be here sometimes on time because of Sydney traffic, going to work, coming here. But try to be here as early as you can. Or try to be here on time so we can, you can be part of the singing. You know, part of opening up the hymn books, learning new songs, singing praises to the Lord. If you haven't got a hymn book at home, let me know. I'll give you some. I'll, I'll let you take some home so you can learn these hymns. You can learn how to sing praises to God. You know, use the opportunity, not just at church, but in your family time to sing praises to God. That will lift you out of the brokenness that you have. Look at verse number 17. This is where we started. The sacrifices of God are our broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, that will not despise. And then it says here in verse number 18, and I, I know this is talking about Jerusalem, but I want to take a spiritual lesson here. Verse number 18, do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion, Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. We're back to where we started, right? With a broken heart. And he says to God, you know, build up the walls of Jerusalem. You see, King David was so scared, was so worried that by his sin, that God will punish all of Jerusalem. And you know, in these days, they would have these walls, right? Around Jerusalem to protect them from the enemies so they wouldn't be overtaken. And uh, he was worried that these walls are going to be broken down. He says, God, because of my sin, please keep these walls up. Keep, keep everyone in the city protected, please, Lord. It was King David, who was worried about his sin. Now, you're not a king. You haven't got these walls around your, you know, Sydney, right? And, um, but one thing that you should be striving to do, especially if you've come out of a broken home, okay? That first marriage, that, that divorce or whatever, you know, those walls were broken down. That marriage, you know, that, those vows, they were broken. Those walls broke down. Okay, And I'm sure it was hard. I'm sure it was very sad. And I'm sure if there were children involved, it broke them as well, right? What I don't want from you, though, if you are in this situation, I don't want your new marriage. You know, I don't want your current situation to break down. 
I want those walls and I'm sure you want your walls of your new marriage. You know, this is your new husband, your new wife. These walls to be strengthened by the Lord. And ask the Lord there, right? He said, look, ask the Lord. You know, what was it? He said um, in verse number 20, uh, sorry, 18, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. He says to God, you build the walls, God. And this is what you need. And if you're, this is your first marriage, ask God again. Build the walls of your marriage. Build them up. Protect your marriage. Protect your family. Don't let these walls break down. Don't Because it's going to destroy you. It's going to hurt you. It's going to hurt the children that go through these situations. And if you find yourself coming out of a broken home, just thank God for where you are now and ask God to build up these walls so they don't break down again. Okay? So... One thing, uh, if you guys please go to Matthew 1, Matthew 1, verse 19. Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. Let's just move on here. And we'll look at a, uh, a blended home situation here in the Bible in Matthew chapter 1. And, uh, and this goes for both broken and blended homes. Is one thing you need to understand, if, you, if you're someone from a blended family or a broken home, if you're the father, if you're the husband, you are the head. This hasn't changed. You are the head of your family. You are the head of your wife. God is holding you accountable for that woman and those children that are in this family unit. Okay? It doesn't matter if they're your biological children or not. God's holding you accountable. You need to take charge of the situation, even though I know it's more difficult. It's more complicated to do that. Look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 19. It says here, this is the story of Jesus, of course. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. So this is divorce. But putting someone away is divorce in the Bible. And so he wanted to basically divorce Mary uh, privately. He didn't want to make it a public example because obviously he loved Mary. And Joseph, he didn't know at this point in time, he didn't know that this was something, a miracle, that this was of God. Now, he thought Mary had cheated on him. He thought Mary had been unfaithful, right? And so he's going to put her away privately. Look at verse number 20. And while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Look at verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou, who's thou? Joseph. Thou, Joseph, right, shall call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. You see, this angel of God comes to Joseph and goes, Joseph, I know you're not the biological father here of, of Jesus. All right? This is, this is a miracle that God has done to Mary. Even though you're not the biological father, Joseph, you're in charge. I'm holding you accountable. I'm giving you direction. You, Joseph, you got to call that child that is born of Mary, Jesus. You see how God holds the father, the husband accountable, even though he's not the biological father of Jesus? And verse number 20, 21, and she shall, uh, sorry, verse number 22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled in which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Look at verse number 24. Then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not till she brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Who called his name Jesus? Joseph, right? God said, Joseph, not your biological son, but you're in charge. You're the husband. You're the man of this house. And Joseph goes, all right, God, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. Man, Joseph had a good character, right? He had good leadership skills. It would have been hard for Joseph, no doubt. It would have been super hard, right? This is not my biological, biological son. But what I want to bring home there, just, just very quickly, and I, sometimes I see this again with blended or broken home families, is sometimes the husband doesn't feel like he has authority in the home. He doesn't feel like he has the respect of the children in the home. And what I'm saying to you, uh, wives, if your husband's from this situation, you've got to encourage him. You've got to make sure he knows he's in charge, even if they're not his biological children. Okay? He's the head of the home, and you've got to give him the respect. You've got to be submissive to his authority. God does it for Joseph. You know, you should be able to do it for your husband so he can take charge of his family. Now, in summary, please go to Proverbs. Uh, let me just think. Now go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, please. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Go there and um, just in summary, 
Again, my intention for this sermon is not to bring back, if you've been from a broken situation, not to bring you back into guilt or sorrow or, or bring back bad memories of your past mistakes. That's not my point, okay? I just want you to understand that God can still use you in your family situation, all right? And there are many people in the, in the, in the Bible that had broken homes, broken situations. Many men took on multiple wives, you know? Some of these men you know, Abraham, you know? Jacob married two sisters. They had family problems. You know, King David, we saw what King David did. You know, Gideon, Gideon in the Bible, a great warrior used by God, had multiple wives. Elkanah, if you don't know, Elkanah, that was Hannah's husband. And, uh, you, know, she couldn't get, you know, she couldn't have children for a long time. And he was married to another woman that had other children. King Solomon, King Solomon, 700 wives, 300 concubines, right? Basically a thousand wives, you know? I mean, these people had broken homes. You know, they had situations that were not the biblical model for a marriage. And yet, how many of these names do you know? How many of these names are held up as godly men, faithful men? Why? Because even though they've made mistakes in the past, God was still able to use them. And let me just say to you, even if you've made mistakes in your past, God still wants to use you. Right? God can still work in you. In fact, you might be able to do greater works for God in His kingdom than the one that comes from a perfect biblical model of marriage. Possible. It's highly possible. You guys are in 2 Samuel chapter 7. I'm going to read to you very quickly from Proverbs 31 verse 1. We've gone through this passage many times in this series of the family. But Proverbs 31 1 says, The words of King Lemuel, and that's, that's Solomon, the prophecy that his mother taught him. His mother was Bathsheba. His mother was the adulterous woman that slept with King David. Okay, that his mother taught him. And she says, what, my son? And what, the son of my womb? And what, the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. We see this adulterous woman with a broken home, with a broken marriage. And God records her words. Inspired words by the Holy Spirit have been recorded for us in the Bible. And she's given good, godly, biblical counsel to her son about the dangers of women, you know, fornicating, and the dangers of alcohol, okay? Good, godly counsel she gives. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. It says here, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, again, her son was Solomon, of course, right? It says here, And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed, this is God speaking, up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of, out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. This is David's son. All right? God is saying to King David that out of your bowels I'm going to establish this kingdom. And of course the first, um, the first uh, application of this is King Solomon. Because King Solomon would succeed from King David as the next king. But let's keep going. Verse number 13. He shall build a house for my name. That again was King Solomon who built the house. who built the temple of God. Right, And then it says this. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Forever. Listen, let me ask you something. King Solomon's mother was Bathsheba, the adulterous woman. God says to King David that his kingdom will be established forever. Now let me ask you something. Is King Solomon alive today? No. He didn't, he's not on the king. Who's the king of Israel right now? In the nation of Israel? Is there a king there? No. So we've gone from the first application. This is a double, double, uh, double application of a, of a teaching here where it, it began about Solomon and now it's gone to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the King of the Jews. Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. And it is the throne, it is the kingdom of Jesus Christ that will be established forever. Look at verse number 14. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Now this is about King Solomon. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee, and thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Now, why are you reading that? Because out of the broken home was later born King Solomon. And from King Solomon, that lineage from the broken home, from the adulterous woman, would lead us to Jesus Christ. To Jesus Christ, the Savior of all men, the King of Kings. Don't tell me God can't use the broken home. Don't tell me God can't use you because you've made big mistakes. 
So did Bathsheba. So did King David. And you know what God promised? Jesus Christ will come from your lineage. These are the ancestors of Jesus Christ. And they made some big mistakes. Big mistakes. Probably bigger mistakes than you've made. All right, many of these people that we read about. God can still use you. And I'm going to quickly read to you from Matthew 1. You can turn there if you want. Matthew 1, 1. I should have told you to stay there. Matthew 1, 1, just very quickly. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Okay? The son of David. The son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Pharisees and Zara of Tamar. And Pharisees begat Ezra. And Ezra begat Aram. And Aram begat Aminadab. And Aminadab begat Naoson. And Naoson begat Salmon. And Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth. And Obed begat Jesse. And Jesse begat David the king. And David, look at this. The king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. And Solomon begat Reboam. And Reboam begat Abia. And Abia begat Asa. The lineage of Jesus Christ. Who gets acknowledged? The adulterous woman. The woman who was the wife of Urias. She messed up. She broke her home. She broke her vows. King David messed up. And yet the Bible puts their names, mentions her in the passages, okay, leading up to the great story of Jesus Christ. Okay. So I'm going to end there, guys. I just want to reiterate. I'm sorry if you've come from a broken home. I'm sorry when you've made bad mistakes in life. And I'm just being honest with you. You're going to have further challenges. It's going to be more difficult, meaning you ha- you're going to have to put more work more work to have a great marriage more work to have a fruitful marriage and just this is just just say to yourself this is the situation i'm in what is the biblical model we've gone through the biblical model how well can i now i know it's never going to fit perfectly but how well can i take the situation i'm in and apply that how god initially you know wanted it to be can i make it that way hey good if there are things you can do to line that up do it you know, that's going to help you in your marriage. It's going to help you to overcome these challenges. But always understand, you're never going to have it perfect. Okay? And just because you can't have it perfect doesn't mean that God doesn't want to use you. God can use you in a great way. All right? Let's pray.